to conclude this session. I'd like to introduce Marcos Di Iorio. Uh, he is from Medic, Chile. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and he's going to present uh, his work, Merrick, Supporting the Development of Marine Energies in Latin America. So, hello, everyone. Marcos Diorio here. I'm from, originally from Mar del Plata. Uh, so, for me, I think everybody here loves, or most of us loves, uh, Energia Marina and marine energy. So, thanks for the organizers. So, thank you very much for this. So, yes, I want to, to present um, as best as I can the efforts made by Chile to develop or help develop marine energy. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, Merrick project and the people involved there and the, and the work that has been done there. So how it started, um, basically the Ministry of Energy and Corfo, which are two um, governmental state uh, agencies, they created this International Excellence Attraction Program. What this means? They were focusing in the transmission of uh, knowledge and technology from um, other countries, mainly Europe, the states, towards uh, the country. So they created this, and one of the focus uh, at that time was marine energy. So they presented this uh, program for which many different entities and companies applied, but the ones who were awarded were um, two companies, Naval Group. At that time was Naval Energies. It's from France. They were developing uh, the Open, I Open Hydro device for tidal energy conversion. I mentioned this because I'm going to come back to that afterwards in the, um, in the talk. And Energy Green Power, which is generation transmission of electricity from Italy. Probably you guys know better than me. With two national universities, uh, Universidad Católica de Chile, um, basically in Santiago mainly, and Universidad Austral de Chile in Valdivia, where we have some representatives here who are going to present their work. So they created um, Merrick, which is itself a project. It, was an eight, it is an eight-year project um, with the objective of developing marine energy in Chile. So uh, a lot has been done in these eight years, so it's difficult not to leave something outside, but I'm going to try to give a big glimpse. So basically, the main idea of what uh, we wanted to do was to understand how prepared um, Chile was for receiving this type of technologies and understand everything from, of course, the potential. So what is the actual resource in Chile? What are the capacities? And so, of course, the resource assessment and site characterization team, both for wave and tidal, was really important work, but that's not itself. So for the environmental side, we had uh, marine corrosion, biofouling, um, understanding how particular each different types of conditions for the Chilean seas and each part of the Chilean seas, or different parts, not each, um, could be different and could affect the potential installation of a device. So uh, a lot of nice work was done there on that side. But also regarding human perception. So basically, they went through many, many different ports, talked to fishermen, fishermen people, to understand how they perceived uh, marine energy and if there would be a post, if there would be for it. So there was a first uh, encounter with uh, marine energy for many people who didn't even know it existed. Um, so that was also a really great job. And also on, also, yes, on the other side, of course, understanding the technology, but not so much um, the te technology itself, because we are not developers, technology developers, but to understand how to adapt those technologies to the local conditions. So this is mainly the work performed by, not exclu exclusively, by the Universidad Austral. So for one side, understanding, um, yes, exactly that. How were the local conditions going to benefit um, the potential installation of different types of technologies, but also what industries could benefit from this uh, 
technologies uh, itself. Other characteristics to be analyzed um, that I didn't mention, of course, uh, what it, which is uh, the main things that concern um, the people when they talk about marine energy installations is um, the potential interaction with mammals, so understanding that as well. So there has been different points of, uh, of measuring insight and also developing of guidelines. And I wanted to highlight this one, the Levelized Cost of Energy Study. So it was the first done in Chile to understand what would be the cost of both developing tidal and um, wave energy in the country. So there was also a really uh, global work. They, had, they visited different shipyards and ports, understanding what would be the supply chain. So, so it's, of course, a preliminary, a first approach, but at least a good approach um, for any developer who wants to come to the country and see if this could be a potential candidate to develop or put in their pipeline of projects. Um, it's a first uh, approach. So it was also really good and something that helped us to give a first glimpse of uh, what can be done there. A little bit of uh, to see where we are. As you know, Chile is a long country, but slim. Um, the different themes are based um, in Santiago. So there we have the uh, Universidad Católica. There's a lot of um, uh, modeling going on there. But this is more related to, you can say, not exclusively, but to tidal energy. So different um, modeling softwares are also um, experimental tags to understand the flow uh, small there. Then in Las Cruces, we have the ESIM, Estación Costera de Investigación Marina, a really beautiful place where the uh, PV3, the, oh, the Open Sea Lab project was installed, but I'm gonna to talk to that, about that in a little bit. And there, um, there are some places to analyze biofouling, biocorrosion, and perform some tests in the water. So a lot of also really nice work there. And finally, uh, the in Valdivia, the Canal de Sessions Hidrodinámicos, where for sure the guys are going to present some of their work. So this is mainly related to the analys analysis of uh, fluid structure interactions, um, of course wave energy devices, and recently um, offshore floating wind structures. So there has been a lot of uh, advances in the tank um, from the upgrading of the uh, wave generator and the installation of, uh, of cameras for motion detection. So also really great work there and they're gonna for sure show what they have done. Oh. Well, there were supposed to be some signs there, but so also we have performed some measuring campaigns, both for wave and tidal. So the main one in wave was in Las Cruces where the open sea level was installed. So it would be in a sim, but also there has been some campaigns in um, tidal stream uh, places, and that would be in, I see. So in the checkout channel, sorry, I cannot sign it, but. Huh? Yeah. Ah, the next one, ah, yeah, sorry for that. So the checkout channel, so this is um, in between the Chilo Island and the, and the mainland, so there's huge, huge currents there, between five and seven meters per second, up to. So it's a really good resource. Um, of course, it's not this, the only element to be analyzed, and that was analyzed there. And the Magallanes Strait, Strait of Magellan, I think it's said in, in English. So um, that was also a really nice part of the, of the experiment to understand what is the actual uh, resource and measure it and go there, also performing uh, more biofouling, more biocorrosion, understanding how, what could be the potential impacts of a uh, device being installed. So um, this is going forward um, a little bit in the in the um, in the history of the of the center. So this is the culmination of let's say the first stage, the first four year stages of the project where all these capacities were developed and converged in this let's say integrated uh, project. So it was the installation of the Open Sea Lab. So this involved the installation of a WEC device. In this case was the PV3 from the company OPT, an American company. And um, this device um, 
doesn't produce too much energy. It was between 10 and 50 kilowatts, more close to 10. But the idea was to transmit the energy and, and power underwater uh, sensors, such as an IDCP, and to um, water quality sensors, those NK SAMBAT devices, and of course the transmission on the, on the top. So this as well, so this is kind of where it was. It was one kilometer from the Estación Costera Investigación Marina, and in the ESIM there was also installed an X-ray expand radar and a weather station. So with all this, you could count with live characterization of a, a really good characterization of a point in, for comparing different uh, conditions. So there's a video in YouTube. I don't know if it's uh, possible to see it, if there's Wi-Fi, but otherwise, I'm going to share this, and you can see it. I don't know if it's, there's Wi-Fi here. Well. But what I wanted to mention that the installation was uh, a challenge itself. Gonzalo was part of it. He can tell you a little bit more about it. But basically, this is comparing. Um, these are two surfing forecasts, so it's not something so technical. But it gives you an idea. It gives you an idea of the wave conditions at the place. So Antofagasta is further up north. There's supposed to be less energy as north as you get in the country compared to uh, the site in Imec. So you can see that the, let's say, quantity and quality of the wave resource in the site of uh, Antofagasta is really good. It's really great, uh, not only for surfers, but um, showing this to different uh, wave energy developers, they see it and they think it's it's amazing, not only because you have energy the whole year round, but let's say the variation range, both in size and, and period, is not so much. So you can really, really optimize your, your design. But talking about installation, that's a different story. Because we don't get those sweet three months of installation periods where weather windows can get uh, better. So. The, the developers came they, to perform the installation, and it was really, really hard to find three-day, four-day um, weather conditions to install the device. And when you, go, you got those four or five days, three days, it was usually with a change in the direction of the wind. So you usually could have a north wind uh, or a little storm. Or, so it was, was a really difficult challenge, but a, a really good learning experience to see how the place where you want to install your device really affects not only the performance of the device, which we know it performed really well, but also the, the operations installations. And that's something that in Bolivia is also being uh, analyzed to see how that can be impacting the development of a, of a project. So I'll leave you the, the video to see it afterwards, but it's a really, uh, some good images from the installation. So I wanted to jump to somehow how the development in marine energy since the beginning of the, of the center has been impacting what we have been doing. So sorry to show some old pictures, but I didn't want to. OK, so anyways, so let's start talking about uh, WAVE. So the first one, the iconic Dipilamis, the 750 kilowatts in 2004, that was 10 years before the center was uh, created, but it was kind of the idea where people wanted to go with wave energy. The next one, the wave roller, 500 kilowatts in 2018, was installed in, in, in Portugal, real first scale. And the latest in one really good device from Core Power, 250 kilowatts in 2021, also in Portugal. So we can see a reduction in the size of the device here. And I would say it's not so much because of a lack of, of success, but from the learning experiences from the previous developers. Kind of what happened to us as well, uh, seeing how the installation of a really simple device could become um, really challenging. On the side of uh, Tidal Energy, we see a similar reduction in size, but not so much on the capacity of the device, but more on the projected installation. So I wanted to come back to Open Hydro, the one in the middle, uh, because basically they were 
one of the main um, uh, participants in the, in, the, in the development of the center. So they were planning on installing, they had already started the construction of a plant to build 100 megawatts of this device. The, I don't remember the name, sorry, but that huge, huge device you see in the middle. And sadly, because of that and, and budget, they had to shut it down in 2018, which was sorry, about the time I entered the, the center. So I remember getting to the center and hearing jokes like, now we're going to only focus on wave. So there's, there's a lot of impact on what happens with the devices, the, the decisions on, on the technology to see how we from not technology developing countries or centers, how to apply this. And you can see on the right, uh, let's call it the evolution, uh, the device from Orbital in 2016 had a different name, but nevertheless, it's a really, really nice and interesting device. And they are starting from small installations to bigger installations. So nevertheless, this, I would say, humbling process, there's still a lot of, a lot of um, uh, a lot of push to continue developing marine energy. So as you can see from the uh, EU strategy, 40 gigawatts, uh, my colleague here also announced it. So there's a huge, huge uh, boost and interest in these technologies to be developing. I wanted to divide in wave and tidal to see what are, would be the focuses. So these are not the only projects, but I wanted to, to highlight these two, Europe Wave, which is uh, destined to fabricate, deploy, and demonstrate prototypes, designs, and the EU scores, which is looking forward to integrate wave energy with, uh, with offshore floating wind, and it's aiming to 1.2 megawatts. On the other side, we have Tidal. These are two projects, really interesting projects. Uh, Tiger on the left is looking forward to cost reductions, 40% cost reductions in the, in the fabrication process, and on the right, this is one of the latest, this has been a, a contract for difference in the UK, aiming to a strike price of 230 uh, euros, but it's looking forward to install 53 megawatts. So up in the scale, but the, here the challenge is the cost reduction of the fabrication. I don't know how I'm doing with time, but please tell me. I'm going to go fast. So parallel to this, to wave energy and tidal energy, we have also the development of offshore floating wind. Why is this important, at least for Chile? Because with these numbers, so at least the predicted numbers um, of dropping the, in the LCOEs and increasing size in production, it opened markets such as the Chilean one, where you don't have a um, sufficient platform to install uh, based uh, float of offshore floating, offshore wind technologies in the water. And just to show this, um, this example, uh, the Windflow project, also in Portugal, in Viana, Viana do Castelo, and you can see it's 25 megawatts. So it's already twice the size of all the energy installed in wave and tidal. So you can see there's also another difference in scale with this type of technology. So it doesn't mean this is better or the one is worse, it's just a different scale. So this is something I wanted to highlight, or at least what we see from Merrick for the future. Um, so technology development basically has a lot of issues um, in common between wave, tidal, and offshore floating wind, but, different, but definitely the challenges are going to depend on the scale of generation and their potential applications. So here's just uh, what could be. And I added some examples, and um, of course when you think in wave energy, at least in Chile, you really want to focus in isolated communities. And uh, there's a huge amount of really small islands that depend on diesel and the transportation of those diesels, where you can see that the price of that energy is really high and wave energy could be competitive. But it's not only that. You have the salination, at least at a small scale. Uh, this is an example from Monica. They have done a small installation in the um, in Algarrobo, it's in like the south central of, uh, of Chile, to produce uh, clean water out of way of energy. This is a completely mechanic device, and it's supposed to be producing between 10 and 30 uh, meters a day. Uh, it's really interesting, and now they're looking forward to upscale. 
The other one is an idea from the Australian company Carnegie, have been developing wave energy for almost a decade now, and they now are transferring te their technology and knowledge towards the aquaculture industry. This could be, not yet, uh, potential energy to supply um, different processes in the, um, in the aquaculture um, breeding process. And to that scale, it could be something that could be um, aligned with the size of the um, aquaculture farms in Chile. Chile is one of the highest producers of uh, aquaculture. I think it's the second in salmon in the world, so it's huge. So it's a huge market. And also marine observation, which seems small, but in the States alone, it's, uh, I think the AUV um, industry, it's over $2.6 billion. Of course, it's the States and everything there is huge, but there's a lot of things where we can see. But basically, um, despite the, the development, it's important to see where the technology is going. I think I wanted to extend too much, but just tell me it's going to be shortly finishing. So this is, an, let's say, mid-scale project. We are really looking forward to, to develop. We have been working in this for over two years now. So there's a huge, huge boost in hydrogen in the world, but Chile has, uh, Chile government has made a statement and wanted to position themselves as one of the lowest cost of hydrogen production in the world, in two places, up north because of the sun, and in the south in Magallanes because of the low cost wind production and really, really privileged um, capacity factors there. But they have different challenges. One of them, as you can see, the local grid is more than 1,000 kilometers from the national grid through fjords, the Andes, so it's impossible to be connected, at least grid connected. So you cannot count on different uh, green energy sources such as uh, hydropower. So as we all know, renewable energy, it's the, despite how good it is, it's not constant, has intermittency. So how can you complement that energy for different processes? So one study we have performed in 2017 was the analysis of the Magallanes Strait. And there, the resource is really good, particularly in the first narrow, the, fir the one in the, in the right. And we can see that there's a potential, there's a niche for pre-commercial and commercial development of tidal energy. Of course, something that has to be explored, but it's something that we're really trying to push forward. And example, a uh, big scale, probably um, Gonzalo is gonna talk more about this. So why we think offshore floating wind is so important for Chile or could be important for Chile. As you can see, this block, it's kind of in the south center. As I mentioned, in the north you have the sun, in the center there's hydropower, but there are not huge, huge um, energy sources, renewable energy sources down south. So you can see that this could be a great complementation, not only in the capacity, but in the diversification of where it could be installed. So this is a really old analysis preliminary, but there's uh, already a uh, visualization of um, an area close to Concepcion where you have really good resource, you have depths that are not so high, uh, not, that, not that far from the coast, and with really nice uh, um, well, winds. Here, the challenge is completely different because the technology, the generation technology is already converged but you have fabrication issues, installation, operation and maintenance, supply chain, regularity, permissions. So there's different, different challenges that are gonna come with different technologies and their um, scale. So, hope, hope I was not too long. Thank you very much for your time. Many thanks, Michael. Any questions? Sí. Bueno, tal vez mientras eh, preguntemos las preguntas. Pasa nomás. Está bueno. Yeah, just a quick comment about your um, the, the wave potential there in Chile, and and that diagram in particular, uh, it's entirely consistent with a study we did. Um, I think it's about seven years ago. That that, that showed that Chile actually was the best place to develop uh, wave energy in mm -hmm. the world, and and particularly, it's it's not about the magnitude of the wave resource, 
it's about the lack of variability. Yes. And if you think about like a thermal power station, you know, it's, it's optimized to run at about, about two and a half, three thousand revolutions per minute, and it's highly optimized around there. I mean, you can deal with variations in, in period using control, mm -hmm. but that comes at a price as well. You mm -hmm. also have force constraints on, the, on the, the, the power takeoff, but it's very hard to deal with, with height range. Mm -hmm. And if you have a consistency in that, it, it, it certainly is the most exploitable resource that I've ever seen. Hmm. So the best to look with it. <laughs> yes, yes, but as I mentioned, it's, it could be a blessing for device uh, production, but for installation it's something that definitely had to be taken into account. And maybe that was something that uh, was foreseen, but maybe underestimated, and um, in the end really took much longer for the installation and, and, and prediction of mightiness, yeah. I have one. I have one. This. Oh, you just mentioned that uh, you were talking about the south of Chile. Yes. Uh, do, do you have already identified which kind of uh, marine technology is better for this area? I remember the, the coast of Chile was very steep, at least in the north. I don't know how is the south. It is, no, no, it's... They it's, have particular features, which... Yes, um, let's say that area that I showed, it could be, it's a bit different. Um, I think Magallanes is the only one has this connection with the platform, but the rest is really abrupt. Um, well, actually, Gonzalo and their team had performed, a, let's say, a white paper or an article showing what would be the, in this case, wave technologies that could fit best yeah. to... Um, to the conditions in Chile, and one of the main reasons that this has to be done also, because it's a seismic country, we have earthquakes and tsunamis, so yeah. everything that is close to the sea, more, other than the wave conditions, is also the potential risk. So um, anything that could be in Chile in the water, thinking about something bottom-based, it has its this additional uh, risk. Yeah, I, I imagine that Chile should have some kind of particular challenge. Yeah. You had it. The Andes there and it was go really deep. Yes, and regarding resource, um, let's say the research gets a bit uh, less uh, energetic as you go further north, but at the same time it's really good. So I would say up north is a bit more um, clean, yeah. the development of the swell. But uh, you would have wave energy all along the coast. Well, any other question? Perfect. Thank you. Many thanks for...